His name is Rodrigo. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, yeah. It's, you, it sounds really funny, but if you're like, let's go eat, they're expecting there's this food called salchipapa, which means like uh, hot dog fries, and it's chopped up hot dog and fries. You know, a little, that's common food. But like, guinea pig's fancy. So if you take somebody at guinea pig, they're like, I mean, they're excited, you know, and uh, it, it's good. Um, but if, if you look up fried koi, C-U-Y, you can see it. I mean, it's just like it's a dead guinea pig. They gut it. They dip it whole in the fryer. You can see his teeth and his jaws. They don't do that in Chile. Um, Chilean food's not that great, and Chileans will tell you that. Uh, they're just like, yeah, our food is, we won't starve to death, but it's okay, you know. We have Wendy's and Taco Bell, so we'll be all right that way. But, and if you like sushi, everybody in Chile loves sushi. But uh, other than that, you know, uh, it's kind of just whatever. But uh, so this is Rodrigo, and this is my favorite testament. Uh, look, anytime anybody gets saved, uh, praise the Lord, it's a good day, right? Uh, but there's certain things that God does that are a little more special in your life because of experiences with God. And so this verse to me is one of those. It says, so Paul says, praying for us for an open door. Right? We're looking for an open door. But we're not just looking to make friends and meet people and hang out. And I'm, right? We're, we're trying to meet people for a purpose. And that purpose is to talk to them about something. And it's not a certain sports team. It's not a certain political party or a club or an affiliation or even the United States, look, I love America, okay? As for, for as great as things aren't right now, this is still a fantastic country. We all ought to praise the Lord that we live here, okay? But I'm not going to South America to turn them into North Americans. We're going to turn them into Christians. That's the only thing that really matters at the end of the day, right? Like, they love to talk about peanut butter because they just it's not a thing in Latin America. Y'all really eat peanut butter? Y'all like this? Like, yes, we do, but we're not going to talk about that. We are going to talk to them about Jesus. And, and, and so his testimony, he... Another cultural thing you got to understand is different. In Latin America, you are young until you're married. So here, 18 to 21, you're, you're becoming an adult. Somewhere in there, you're, a, you, you're a, a man, you're a woman. But in Latin America, when you get married, you're a man. It's not an age thing. And so um, Hannah's brother got married about two years ago, and his wife was 19 when they got married. Well, she's not a senorita anymore. She's an old senora at 19 years old because she's married. But if you're like 35 or 40, you're still considered young and so youth group it's like here's a 14 year old here's a 19 year old here's a 40 year old here's a 20 year old and it's, it sounds kind of funny kind of, but it's not weird it's just that's just the way it is and so we did youth group on Saturday nights and so we did play some some games and stuff and they play some weird games but we play some games 20 minutes 30 minutes but then when we had songs afterwards like a song service and we preached I mean it was like bible preaching I mean it was, it was church and so he, he comes, he gets in contact with us, and he, he comes, and he's like, hey, I've never been to church before. I was like, man, fantastic. Uh, I'm preaching tonight, and I want you to listen for three things. I've got three points on my message. You're a sinner. There's punishment for your sin, and only Jesus can give you forgiveness. He's like, okay, great, I'll listen. So he comes, he listens, he doesn't get saved. Monday night, we get together, and he's like, man, that was great. I had a blast. I want to know more. Do you think you could teach me about God? I don't know nothing about God. I thought, yes. Yes, I can. I mean, you talk about another opportunity. Someone looks and says, please teach me. And he knows, I mean, he really didn't know anything. Right, Axel, his aunt, had gone, praise the Lord, she's one of the very few people who'd been to a gospel preaching church. I mean, he knew so little that when I was teaching him, it was like, hey, big verses are chapters, little verses are numbers. Try explaining to somebody who's never read the Bible before that 1 John is not John's first book. It's like, well, it's called 1 John, but it's John's second book. We said, why don't they call that one 2 John? I just call regular John 1 John. I'm like, I don't know, man, quit asking questions like this. But he doesn't, he doesn't I mean, they just don't know. Like, it makes sense. I, it's like, that makes but he just doesn't know anything. So I was like, what do you teach somebody who's like ground zero? So like, Romans Road? I mean, I, I'm pretty sure my Spanish Bible's in the car. Um, and I can show you, I, right next to Romans 3.10, I've written Romans 3.23. And I, I mean, I know all those verses in both languages, but I don't want to forget when I'm witnessing to somebody. And I've, I've shared those verses with so many people. So Romans 3, okay, now go to 3.23. Now go here, now go here, now go. And I share it with him, and he goes, man, I've never heard that before. I mean, can you imagine getting to your 20s not even having heard the Romans Road? Like this, the concept that you are a sinner, that you are going to go to hell. He's like, man, I've never, ever heard this. Stuff. First week, he doesn't get saved. Second week, he does. Uh, we get back together. We're still coming around. I said, Ephesians chapter 2. You are dead in your sin, and there's nothing you can do to give yourself. Only Jesus can give you life, and he wants to give you that gift. What do you think? And he's like, man, I, I understand what you're saying, you know, but I got a problem. And he goes, I want to be a millionaire. And I don't know what the Bible says about that. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. I mean, he's poor. I mean, and there's, there's poverty and poorness in America. I understand that. But it's just different overseas. Like, what, what is a need here is, is, is not a need over there. What is a want here is, is, I mean, a luxury. And so his house, I mean, he's very, very, very poor, probably stealing water, stealing electricity, maybe even has a dirt floor, like a painter's tarp over a thing for a floor. 
a real cheap cement. So I get it. He's unsaved. He's poor. He wants to be rich. Makes sense. So I said, all right, I got you. So the third week we get together. He's still coming around. We're still studying the Bible, still coming to services. So I said, all right, man, Luke's gospel. We go to the gospel of Luke, and we read the story of rich man and Lazarus. Rich man, you know, he dies, he goes to hell. Lazarus, he dies, he goes to Abram's bosom, he goes to paradise. I said, now what's the purpose of this story? He goes, okay, I see, I see what you're doing. Money's not important. Family's important. I was like, you missed it by this much. Because what, La- what does the rich man say? He says, send Lazarus back. But why? He says, because I have five brothers. And I don't want my, bro- hell's so terrible, I don't want my family to come here. And he goes, oh. So I need to get saved. I was like, yeah. And on, like, I, there was no poking or prompting or, hey, do you want to repeat after me? He just, on his own, he goes, God, I need to talk to you. I need to get saved. And he prayed and got saved. And that's my favorite story to tell. I mean, that is like my favorite testimony to tell because that's, I mean, that's this verse. That's the purpose of this verse. Paul says, pray for an opportunity. Pray for an open door. And he, he just gave me, I mean, it was just like ridiculous. Like God just gave me the most open door. He just said, will you just please teach me about God? Will you just please teach me about the Bible? And he just, and he just kept coming around. He just didn't get scared off. I was like, this is great. But it's not just an open door. It's an open door for the mystery of Christ. It's the gospel. And listen, I worked really hard at my Spanish. I mean, we're, him and I both worked very hard to learn Spanish. And I'm, I mean, remember I told you I got hit by that moving van? When I got hit, I forgot English. Like, I just clicked over into Spanish, and it took me a couple hours to click back. And we worked really, really hard at it. I mean, I still, to this day, I do my devotions in Spanish. If I can find a book in English or Spanish, I try to read it in Spanish because it's ministry is talking. And you need, especially need to be talking the Bible. So I worked really hard I learned, but he didn't get saved because my Spanish is good. Because I know, I know how to roll my R's. And I know all the right cool phrases. He got saved because the word of God did a work in his life. And I can't explain it. And I can't understand it. But God's word supernaturally, spiritually worked in his heart. And he came to a point in place where he realized he was going to die and go to hell unless he put his faith in Jesus. And he got saved. And I just love to see that. I just absolutely love. Because it's, it's this verse. Uh, uh, one man said that the history of missions is the history of answered prayer. I think that's true. I think the history of Christianity is the history of, of answered prayer. Let's move on to the, to the next picture here. Um, so that, that's, that's like, my name is Rodrigo. So I told everybody's really, 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 really short, uh, as you can tell. So in this picture, you've got a lady with a purse, and you've got a little girl with sunglasses, and then that girl in the middle, not the little little girl, but the, uh, the, the regular little girl in the middle, her name is Angela. Um, she came, and again, youth meeting, I was preaching, and you know, like when you travel and preach, you've got... Five or six good messages, right, sugar sticks, that you just kind of know as you're traveling, preaching messages. I'll tell you a secret about missionaries. If you make us preach for more than three services, we'd all be sunk because we got maybe, maybe three messages, you know, Sunday, morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night. So we just preach the same messages everywhere we go. But, and then and hopefully they work. But when, when Angela came, I don't remember what we were preaching. Now, every time you preach the Bible, it's the Word of God. It's powerful. I understand that. Um, but there are some passages and, and moments and meetings that are just really special, right? Revivals and camps and those kind of things. When she came, it was just like we were just going through Ephesians, pretty sure. It was just a regular old, like, I'm doing my best to preach the Bible message. And I gave an invitation, and I, we, all, we always give an invitation to get saved. I mean, because you never know if somebody's coming back, and you always got visitors, and you never know, you know what's going on. So we're, I'm preaching this. Now, if you're here today, and you're not saved, and you want to... You want to trust Jesus. And, I mean, she about took her sister's face off with her hand coming up. I mean, her hand just shot right up. And her sister raised her hand, too. So uh, another lady in the church named Silvia and Hannah took them out and talked to them and counseled them. And they got saved the very first time they came to our church. And they pretty much did not miss a church service ever again after that. It was incredible. It was like they got saved and they meant it. You know, I mean, it was just. And so sometimes it takes a few weeks. And in her case, I mean, maybe God had done something before. I don't know. But first time she showed up, man, she got, she got born again and God did something. Now, look at the next picture. Um, this guy's name is Ernesto. As you saw, Ernesto, everybody's really short. You saw a picture of Preach. Look at this guy. You saw Preach. You saw, you saw, you saw Preach. He's so much taller than everybody. I mean, it's, we, it's weird. It's weird. I've met several professors like Dr. Wright, and they're all like, I mean, Ernesto Pizzoli and Ryan Wright, they're all like, stop right there. I believe in Jesus. Um, he, the way he got in the church, he was standing at the bus stop. Your daughter, she said, Hey, 
discipleship, just do discipleship and going through it, just giving them the gospel, giving them the gospel. Our discipleship is called fundamentals because, I mean, it's like, this is who God is. This is who Jesus is. This is who the Holy Spirit is. Now let's go back and let's review that just so you're really, I mean, it's just real basic stuff. And so um, we're, we've been doing it a few weeks, and he, um, I actually got invited while I was in Peru, another missionary at our church, Jason Holt. Uh, he invited us down to Chile to, to preach his youth camp. And it, I mean, we, had, we went, we had a blast from Sunday morning to Sunday morning. I preached 18 times. Most I've ever preached in, in Spanish, let alone English. I mean, it was just a fantastic time. Saw some people saved, saw some people called in the ministry. But I was getting ready to travel for that, and he's getting ready to travel the week after we get back or something. I'm like, hey, I'm not going to see you for three weeks, so keep reading your Bible. I was like, read John. That's what I was telling him. I always tell people, read John. That's about who Jesus is. You need to point an unbeliever to a book to read in the Bible. Just go to John. It's all. It's written that we may know and believe who Jesus is. Right? Go to John. So he's reading John. So we get back a few weeks later, and he's like, hey, um, I want to talk to you about getting baptized. And I'm like, we can talk about it later after you get saved, but baptism is not for lost people. It's for saved people. And he goes, oh, I didn't tell you. Uh, last time when we got together to study the Bible, I went home and I was thinking about it and I was laying in bed and got saved. I was like, man, praise the Lord. Like, and this one was like, put the seed and just let it go and just let God work, you know? I think there's one more picture after this. Um, this is Frank. And again, I told you, like you thought I was joking, 5'8". There's a reason you've never heard of a Peruvian NBA player, ever. You know, ever, and you never will. Um, <laughs> So this is Frank. He came. We did an English class. For whatever reason, people would look at me and they would just say, "Hey, are you, you're not from here. You're, are you an American?" And I don't. I mean, I don't. I think we look pretty similar. I don't know how they could tell that I was <laughs> different. But so they were like, "We'll start English class." I was like, "I don't want to start English class. That's, I'm not. I'm just here to preach. Bless God." But enough people started asking. I was like, "All right, we'll try it." So we tried it once. It didn't go that well. But I was like, "I don't know. I mean, I really think there's some potential there." So we tried it again, and the second time, I don't know what the difference was. I mean, God just like opened up the doors of blessing. We had uh, over a hundred different people visit. It wasn't like, hey, we're in English class. You know, by the way, Jesus is cool. Maybe you think about it. It's like, hey, we're a church. Uh, we want you to come visit our church. We're doing an English class for free because we want to serve you. Jesus didn't come to serve or to be served, but he came to serve. And so we want to be like Jesus and we want to serve you. Here's a flyer for friend day. Here's an invitation to these special days. And we saw at the very end, I said, if you graduate, which means if you're just, if you endure until the end, you don't got to do your homework. You just got to make it to the end. Eight weeks. That's all we're asking. We'll have a special graduation service during our midweek service. Everybody, we had like 20, 20 to 25 people came, visitors, family. They all got a Bible. We preached the gospel to them. And this guy, his name is Frank. So that's how we met Frank. This is at the English graduation service. And so I know you're not supposed to do this. Right? I know this is like not good preaching, pastoring. But I'd witness to him, and he just wouldn't, like, it's just like, it w he wouldn't get saved. I'm like, Frank, you know you're a sinner. Yeah, you're going to die and go to hell. How about that? You could be saved. I bet I could. You want to get saved? No, I'm all right. <laughs> week after week, I mean, I'd preach. I'd be like, if you're here, and your name is, well, I'm not going to say your name, but if you're here, and I'm staring him down. If you're, if, you're, if you're wearing a blue shirt, and if you're looking at me right now, and if you've got a little ponytail right here that you wear behind your ear, and we're making eye contact, and you want to get saved, and he's like, I'm like, I was so frustrated. Like, I just, and I know that I can't get people saved. It is a delicate balance. Salvation is a work of the Lord. Sure. Now, I'm, I am not a Calvinist. I am by no means that way. I do not believe or support that doctrine. But the truth is that it is a work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I was, I, was, and I, I was like, it's so frustrating that way sometimes. Like, I wish I could make somebody get saved. But I can't. And so I, all I can do is give them the word and give them the word and give them the word. I get it to their ears and I have to trust the Holy Spirit to get it to their hearts. But we came back to America and I got word that months later, Frank got saved. And so it's like, man, some people get saved right away. Sometimes it takes a little while. Sometimes it takes a lot, a lot of while. And I got some other friends that, in Peru that are still not saved. And there's seven-something million people in Santiago. And there's 20 million people in the, in the total in the country. And they need somebody to go and give them the gospel. There's some people that got, look, all this stuff that's happening, go talk to a lost person. They're horrified. I mean, they're, they're, it's like they really think it's the end of the world. I'm like, buddy, buckle up, because if you're here in a few years, it's going to get really bad. Right. Like, I'm not happy that 200,000 people have, have, or however many people have died from this. That's sad. That's, I mean, that every, anytime somebody dies, it's a sad thing. Sure. But, I mean, I know what happens to me when I die. Our, our pastor, got, he got this virus, and he was on a, a ventilator for three weeks, and the hospital told us he ain't getting out of here. He's old. He's overweight. He's missing one kidney that he lost to cancer. Y'all better make prayer. Like, I'm like... And God spared him. Which, by the way, you want further proof of God answering prayer? Check, check our live stream here in a few minutes, you know? But he's up there preaching. So I get it. It's scary. And I don't want him to die from it. I've had other friends, pastors in Peru, pastors here in the States, who have passed away from it. And it's sad. And it hurts. But I know where they're at. They're with Jesus. 
Like the, the, their death only hurts us. It doesn't hurt them. Right. Lost people don't have that hope. They don't have that. I know that no matter how bad this world gets, no matter how horrible and how far in the gutter our country gets, this is not my hope. Right. And this is not my home. My home is in heaven and my hope is in Jesus. I mean, really. We could become the most awful, communistic, atheistic, godless country on earth and we're going to win in the end. We have that hope. Unsafe people don't have that hope. They think, they think it's the end of the world. You know what would give them that hope? Jesus. And how are they going to get that hope if not for you and for me? The, the honest truth is that the unbelievers of our country are a little more blessed than unbelievers overseas. Because overseas they don't have churches like this one that care about their souls. There's not a place like this. There's not a body of believers who's praying for them, who's giving out tracts, who's witnessing, who's trying to talk to their family. And so and the purpose of prayer, one of the big purposes of prayers is for opportunities to share the gospel. I, like I told you, I have an unsafe family member. My, my aunt, her name is Ann. I've never sat down and witnessed to her. Now, she's been in church when I've preached, but I mean, personally, I still feel like my debt to her is greater than just having her be in a building when I'm preaching the gospel. I feel like I owe her to sit down and at least talk to her at least once. And I was, I mean, she's a, she's a police captain in D.C. I mean, so we were there at Thanksgiving, and she's like, hey, if my phone rings, y'all need to let me know. It means, you know, there's big, there's like, she's like, here's, here's in charge of all the police of D.C., She's like half a step below that. I mean, so she's like an important person. She's got a lot of money. She just shows up in her brand new Jaguar SUV that she bought. I'm like, I have a beige 04 Honda Accord that I bought used. You know, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you know, like, it's intimidating. And I've known for years that I need to witness to her. And I've been praying and saying, God, give me the opportunity. God, give me the opportunity. That's the purpose of praying. For, so we purpose to pray. We, the purpose of prayer is for opportunities to witness to the gospel. Where's that power for that prayer come from? That, that power to witness. Look at verse 4. That I may make it manifest as I ought or as I should speak. We should share the gospel. It's uncom- Look, it's uncomfortable for me. There's things that are just uncomfortable to talk about. I mean, I used to work as a medical interpreter. You know, where like you go to the doctor and you and the doctor speak a different language and you've got some funky growths or other kind of things and you got to talk about it and I'm interpreting in the middle. I'm like, this is really weird for all of us, okay? Like, it's uncomfortable. But, I mean, I got it. It's my job. It's uncomfortable to share the gospel with people. But it's our job. And I'm a, I, I'm a pretty wild, crazy person. I like to think. I mean, I like to have fun. You know, I've turned 30 next, next two weeks from now. I mean, age is only a number, right? I'm getting old, but it's only a number. I mean, I like... I went skydiving in Chile. I want to go again. I mean, I like doing fun stuff, and I don't really get scared all that easy, you know, but when it comes time to share the gospel, I'm like knees knocking, pants wet, and biting my fingernails, just like terrified sometimes. I'll be real with you guys. I get really scared to share the gospel. One of the rules that we have is if we see, an un- we see a new person in church, I'm at least going to try to talk and share the gospel with them. They may, not be, they may be saved. They may not be saved. They may never come back to church ever again. This may be their only opportunity to hear about Jesus. I've been in church so many times where I see a visitor and I'm like, I think my stomach hurts. I think I got the rumbling tummies. I got the mission field stomach. I better just go on home until this thing passes. No, you're just scared. I'm just scared. But here's, I don't think that's bad. I think it's normal. Because I think in that moment, the devil knows what's about to happen. And you can tell me I'm crazy, whatever. I mean, I know, whatever. I don't really care. I think that the devil does something, demonic oppression, I don't know what the word is, but he does something to make it hard for us to witness to that person because he doesn't want them to hear the gospel. We're in spiritual warfare. We don't fight against, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and darkness. And That's what we're fighting against. And so, of course, it's going to be tough. The devil's going to do everything he can to make it hard. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we overcome that? It's not just saying, all right, here we go, one, two, three, and just go. We stop and say, God, would you give me boldness? Go read the book of Acts. When they suffer and, and, and they go through it in boldness, they mention the boldness, the Holy Spirit usually shows up right beforehand. So pray and say, God, give me that opportunity, but God, give me that boldness. God, give me that power. Give me Holy Spirit power to be able to share the gospel. And I'll be honest with you, for as many people as I've, God's given me the opportunity to witness to, there's been exactly one person who has ever like, tried to fight me over it. And he really did actually try to fight me. I mean, he was like a pizza delivery guy who was this tall when I worked at Papa John's. It was not a great time, but... I tried. He's like, what do you know about my life? And he's like, jab me. I'm like, whatever, dude. Like, manager sent him home for the day. That's it, one time. 30 years. I've had one person. You look at somebody and say, hey, I want to talk to you about something that's very important to me. I don't want to hurt your feelings or anything. I don't want to, you know, um, cross the line. But I want. it's very important. I'd like to talk to you about it. They're going to say yes. I mean, in my experience, 
I want to be able to say, okay, I'm not, I'm not very interested in religion. Thank you very much. But I'm like, okay, you know, I'm not going to hold you down and shout the gospel at your face, you know, until you get saved. That's not a great testimony. But most people, they'll, they'll at least let you give it to them. And that's all, that's all that we're supposed to do. And my aunt, I said, hey, before you leave, I want to talk to you about something. It's really important. You know, we, we lived in Peru. Now we're going to Chile. And I just want to share something with you really important. And she listened. And I think, I think it might have, I mean, we're still praying for her. So, so how do we get that power to witness you want to witness to a family member, a coworker. Don't just start by trying to just, you know, be real tough and pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Just say, God, give me the power. God, and it's, it doesn't make it all a whole lot easier. It's still kind of scary. Sometimes it is. Hey, you're talking about something. Like, excuse me. I mean, but it's like it's like toothpaste out of a, a, a the the the, tu- the tube. Once it's out, it doesn't go back in. You know, like, well, here we are. So I might as well talk to you about Jesus. And I, th- I think you'll find that once you start, it's actually a lot of fun. It's actually really good. I've done a lot of exciting things. I mean, I've, I've seen, seen volcanoes in Peru. I've been through the rainforest in Ecuador. I've skydived in Chile. But there's nothing as fun or as great or as rewarding as giving somebody the gospel. Right? I mean, I remember preaching, and I'll, I'll finish with this, but I remember preaching in this little church in a place called Apipa. It's a little neighborhood in Peru, and it's like dirt floors. We, we go, and Hannah's like, excuse me, Pastor, can I use the bathroom? He's like, we don't have running water. But there's a dirt pile out back. You can go kind of hide behind that. Like, oh, I think I'll hold it. I mean, it's just poor. There's like stray dogs walking in, chickens there. I mean, it's just poor, poor, poor. I remember preaching during, during Easter, or Holy Week as it's called, and giving an invitation and seeing people raise their hand to get saved, and that memory will be with me. And that's one of the most cherished memories I have is getting to give people the gospel. And so all those people that you saw, you had a part in them getting saved. I know missions, sometimes it feels like it's like we, never, we, we plant, we never see the harvest. You just hopefully encourage seeing a little bit of that harvest of people that got saved and people that, that, that God used your prayers, that God used your giving, that God used this church. When I say we went and gave them the gospel, it's not we as in Hannah and I, it's we as in us. We went. Physically, only Hannah and I did. We all went with us in prayer, in giving, and support, and in fellowship. So thank you very much. We're heading to Chile. More of the same. Give people the gospel, see people saved, baptized, and see churches started. Thank you so much. Let's pray. Lord, we do love you and thank you for the day. God, I pray that you would just bless, help us to have a good service. I pray that your word would speak to hearts. I pray that lives would get changed. I pray that people would be saved. Lord, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.